Right. Let me begin by just saying that I had a plan, and as it seemed to me, it was a cunning, sneaky plan. So I'd been getting requests for another Refugium video for ages now, and as 2021 was drawing to a close and I was wrapping up with Alien Biospheres Part 12, I, very naively, thought to myself that making a Refugium video at this juncture would be the perfect opportunity for me to get a little bit of a break. Because, so I thought, making a Refugium video would be really, really easy, because all I have to do is copy and paste the information I already have and just write it out into a proper script, and there we go. So I was like, I can probably do that in like a couple of weeks, no problem. So that means I can take it easy over the holiday season, and then I can fix something up for early January. You think I would have learned by now, because of course not only were there several annoying real life things that I had to deal with, but also for some reason I just felt compelled to write the whole script in this very flowery purple prose just to make it more thematic, and I just ended up rewriting the thing over and over again, making it sound increasingly fancy and over the top. And increasingly, as I was doing this, I just kept thinking to myself, is anyone actually going to care about this? Because it's so different from all of my other stuff. Like, even the original Refugium video was at least tangentially related to some of the other stuff I talk about. But this is just about, like, magic and mysticism and philosophy and other weird abstract stuff like that. And so then I started doubting myself, and when that happens, that always makes my progress a lot slower. And now we're midway through February, and I only just uploaded the video two days ago. So now I'm way, way behind schedule for what I had in mind for this year. So I'm really going to have to step on it to get back on track. And the first step in doing that is making another one of these. So... A big thank you once again to all of the patrons for sticking with me for my admittedly very sporadic upload schedule at this point. And now, let's dive on in. Okay, so, we've actually got a fair bit of follow-up to cover. First of all, I was just reviewing the sound changes and just spotted a couple of things that I think are in need of correction. Like, this very first change that we have here, where these sounds become palatalized before front vowels, I realized that, for some reason, I included all of these consonants that have palatal equivalents, except for G, which for some reason just stays G. Which, thinking about it, makes no sense. That would almost certainly become palatalized in exactly the same environment. Like, if it's happening to K, why wouldn't it also happen to G? So I added G to those changes, and I also changed it so that the consonant Y is now also causing palatalization. That only makes sense, I think. And then down here, originally, we had it so that G becomes the voiced velar fricative between vowels and goes to the palatal stop everywhere else. But seeing how it's already becoming palatalized up here, I decided we can just go ahead and say that it becomes the voice to velar fricative everywhere. Yeah, it just seems neater and just makes more sense to me. And if it's turning into the palatal stop that often, and the palatal stop more often than not just ends up as an R, we've already got a lot of R's in this language, which we'll come back to in a second, but I think this should limit that slightly. And then down here, I said that these palatal sounds just become alveolar in clusters, but it occurs to me that that doesn't make any sense if they're clustering with something else that's also palatal. That would just mean that the entire palatal cluster just becomes alveolar without any clear motivation. So I've added that little caveat in there, which doesn't really change anything considering that later down the line, palatals just merge with alveolars anyway. So that's all fine and good. I've also added in this monophthongization rule, because in doing the sound changes, I kept coming across points where there was a diphthong before a coda consonant, and I didn't hugely like that. Diphthongs in general I'm fine with, but for this language I'm not feeling them specifically before coda consonants, so I'm saying in that environment, 
they simplify according to these patterns here. So a word like einta would simplify to enta. And then down here, I suddenly felt bad about the loss of word final h. I don't know, that just seems unnecessary to me now. I might say, just as a general allophonic rule, that h goes to the velar fricative when in coda position, or some other similar change. So yeah, I think we could have h's at the end of words. I think that's that's fine now. So I'm just going to get rid of that rule. And then this last and very important rule, because as you may have noticed, this language has a lot of R's in it. Like looking at the protolang, there's like eight different sounds that have the potential to turn into an R based on phonetic environment. And that's not even including the actual proto-R. So a lot of the words that we've been deriving have had a lot of R's in them. So I was trying to think of a way to mitigate that, I toyed around with some ideas of maybe if you have multiple R's in a word, one of them gets deleted. But after thinking about it for a bit, I think I'm going to go with this idea of liquid dissimilation. And I wasn't even really sure how to write this down as a formal change. But essentially, if you have a word like ranra, where you got two syllables bordering each other, that both have R's in them. Whichever one is stressed keeps the R, and the other one becomes an L. So that would become Ranla. Just a nice way of introducing some variation. Now we've already said for certain common words like like to love, the second principal part should be Murur, with two R's next to each other, but we said those R's just blended into each other and it just turned into a long vowel with a single R. And that I'm fine with, because this is a pretty common word, so it's likely to be irregular. Same with to hit down here, where the third principal part should be rarak. So we could either say that it is indeed irregular, and the second R just got skipped over, and keep it as rak, or if it's not irregular, it would be ralak. Oh yeah, also, I realized originally the protoform was zaki, but I forgot that the I would palatalize the K. So all the Ks in these forms would either be Ys or Ss. But I decided to keep it as a K, so I changed it to a Zaka. I mean, to hit is a reasonably simple, common verb. I think I'm going to keep it irregular for now, but I might change my mind about that later. Also, I changed some of our person markers slightly. For the first person, plural inclusive, I just changed the protoform from tum to tam, just because I would like the forms slightly better, and no other reason. And it doesn't really affect anything anywhere else except for the prohibitive. So the polite prohibitive used to be tinke, and now it's tunke, which sounds a bit like danke. That's unfortunate. And also for the inanimates, the protoform used to be gi, but that G, especially with the updates that we've made to the palatalization rules, that G would always turn into an R, as far as I can immediately think. Which for these auxiliaries would be fine, but for the case endings, I'd rather not have every single noun ending with some variation of an R suffix. So in order to do that, I just took off the G and just said that the protoform is just an E. If I remember correctly, long, long ago, I did consider doing that, but I discounted it because it felt a little bit too contrived to have the class marker just be a single vowel. But that's fine. We could just say that before the proto-language, it was something a little bit longer, but then it just got whittled down by this stage. And then on a related note, if you remember last time we derived a word for water, well, since then, the more I've thought about it, the more uncomfortable I am with the length of some of these. Like the accusative singular is rilaninra. It's four syllables and it's got a geminate in there. Whereas water is a pretty basic term. So what I did was reduce the protoform to only one syllable so that the protoform was just ran and then just ran it through all the suffixes. And oddly enough, and completely coincidentally, the inanimate singular would be ranra, which is the example that I just made up to demonstrate the dissimilation rule. So I guess that would get 
dissimilated then. There we go. And the one underneath it as well. Now what I don't know is why I had the animate stem and applied the singulative to it. That's not even remotely close to correct. Ignore that. What we should do is apply the dual suffix to that. So if I'm not mistaken, those would be the forms we would get. Alright, well, with all of that follow-up out of the way, so you will recall that the bit that we got stuck on last time was these applicatives, particularly in reference to the detransitive. And the more I thought about it, the more I think it just makes sense to have the applicatives just be the thing that's closer to the verb stem, especially if they're having some sort of derivational effect on the verb stem, then it just makes sense that they would be closer to the verb. So regrettably, that means we have to just sort of redo this bit. So I'd roughed in a potential tar prefix for the detransitive and just mucked around with some potential forms for these new applicatives. I've also been thinking more about exactly what applicatives I want to have, because I've gone back and forth about which ones I want to include for a while now, and I want to do something just a little bit more interesting than the bog-standard benefactive instrumental locative. I mean, those are by far the most common ones, and those are the sort of archetypical ones to have. But I did a bit of reading on applicatives and had a look at some of the more interesting configurations cross-linguistically. And I think I've come up with a schema that I like. So first of all, the benefactive is cross-linguistically the most common type of applicative. Which honestly kind of surprises me, because to me that seems to be the one that would be the easiest to do without. Because I could imagine, for example, a locative applicative could convey a, the same sort of sense of doing something for or to someone. And in fact, in doing some research, there are some languages that have that overlap. And so in light of that, I think I'm going to change the benefactive applicative to a directional applicative that just has the sort of meaning of in the direction of. And that can be used literally, if you like, to mean movement, like to go towards something, or it can also be used benefactively, and it can also be used to mark goal or intent. So like, I am making this language for fun. You could use this applicative to get across that meaning. And for the lexical source, the most obvious one that occurs to me is go, because you can easily see how a verb like to go could turn into an adpositional thing of toward or to, and with enough bleaching it just gets extended into this very neutral sense of in a general direction. But I did see one language, and I can't remember what it was, but apparently it has a directional applicative that is transparently related to the verb that means to see, which I think is really interesting. So like, I built a house for John would be like, I built a house seeing John, or I guess it would literally be, I built see John. It's like, you're doing the action with an eye towards so-and-so, whatever the object is. And I do like that one a lot, so I might steal that. So I'm going to make a note of that and decide later. So the one that's non-negotiable, at least in phonological form, is this me prefix, because we've already used it for this possessive word. Which I guess I could redo again if I needed to, but I'd rather keep me if I can. And we roughed that in as a committative, because for the possessive word it's literally to be with. And we could keep the committative as its own applicative, but it's very common for a committative meaning to be encoded by the locative applicative. So I'm going to combine them together into one. I think for a general locative meaning we could have a verb like to touch, or maybe to accompany, or some sort of very semantically weak word that means to co-occur with, or to be together with, something like that. And then for the instrumental, it would seem very intuitive, I think, to have the lexical source for the instrumental be to use, because that's pretty definitively an instrumental verb. But I was thinking, if we use something a little bit less specific, like if we use take, 
then I think that would give this applicative a little bit more freedom to fill in some extra uses. Because of course, very often applicatives, even though they have this label of being benefactive or locative or instrumental or what have you, a lot of the times they are able to fill in extra roles. Like if you look at Ainu, Ainu has, I think, three applicatives, and there is a very lively debate about what exactly each of them do and when you use one over the others. And there doesn't seem to be a very clear pattern there. They have some vague tendencies, but it's not like any given applicative has exactly one role that it's filling. So in this case, if we use take and just sort of let the lexical source guide us, then I think that will give this applicative some, some more interesting uses to fill. And because of that, because it's not purely filling just an instrumental function, I'm going to go ahead and call it a circumstantial applicative, which from what I've seen in a lot of the languages that have this Austronesian alignment system, circumstantial seems to be a sort of catch-all term for the, the voice that does everything else. Usually there's a collection of relatively clearly defined ones, like benefactive, instrumental, locative, etc. And then you've got the circumstantial, which is for basically like everything else. So in this case, circumstantial will be for both instrumental, and I imagine in some instances, depending on exactly the semantic properties of the verb it attaches to, maybe like an ablative meaning in some instances. And also, I saw several languages in my research that allow the instrumental applicative to encode the sense of because of, like to encode a reason, which I think makes sense. Because if you say something like, I don't like Bob because he is rude, if you frame that as, I don't like Bob by means of his rudeness, you're highlighting the rudeness as the means by which the verb of you not liking Bob is happening. So for now, I'm going to stick with a core set of these three. Might add another one later, but for now I'm going to go with these. So since this phonological form for the locative is non-negotiable, if we say that the earliest protoform was literally just mi, then this is the verb we would get for that, meaning to touch or to be near or something along those lines. Oh yeah, and since we're no longer having this directional thing being strictly benefactive, I'm not sure that give makes sense as a lexical source anymore, so I'm going to get rid of that the form there. So essentially, just to remind you, when this prefix is the first element in a word, because this language doesn't allow word initial clusters, there will always be a vowel after that M. But if there's another prefix that precedes the locative applicative, like for example, the detransitive, then that I vowel will disappear, or any short vowel that happens to be separating that M from a following consonant, and then the M will assimilate to it. So like if we made up the word Kan. With just the locative applicative, it would be mikan, but with the detransitive on top of that, it would be tankan. And I do really like how those don't look so obviously related. And I'm wondering if we could pull the same trick with at least one of these other two applicatives. I like the idea of this form here with having a coda s in there. We could make it sa or something, so that just like this form it begins as just a CV prefix, but when the detransitive applies, it collapses down into a cluster. But I actually think I like the idea better of just always keeping it as underspecified low vowel followed by S, just because I like the idea of having lots of clusters with S in this language. And then if we keep it as vowel initial, then the detransitive will just surface as a T at the beginning of that. So it won't add an extra syllable, so that won't be too cumbersome might make it a long vowel just for the sake of variety. So I'm trying to get a phonological form for a verb that would result in this prefix, but I realize that most things will actually give us a form that's basically identical to the standard copula up here, at least in the first principal part, which isn't a bad thing necessarily. Okay, I think if we have the protoform Higusu, that will give us these forms here, which are pretty good, I think. 
And that second principal part is another instance of our liquid dissimilation rule kicking in, because it would be rur, but that coda r turns into an l to dissimilate. So another sound that I would quite like to have in coda position is an l. But once again, I actually think I prefer the idea of having that L always be in coda position than having something like La. I think Al would just sound better, or Il actually is quite nice. And that would also mean if we say that that Il uh, is more prominent than the A in the detransitive, then the detransitive plus the directional would be Til, not Tal, which would distinguish it from the other two. And coming up with a quick protoform for that does give us this rather nice verb. And remember, this is going to mean either to go or to see, probably. Which means this is going to be a pretty common and pretty important verb. Even if it doesn't directly survive into the modern language, even if it gives way to some other form, I can still imagine it being used as some sort of derivational element or maybe frequently used in compounding to derive other verbs. Well, I actually like the sound of all of those. Okay, so input those into the protolang. Still haven't decided about this one, but I will probably do that off air. I forgot to make a protoform for the detransitive. So we're saying whatever this is, is very old. It probably would have already had a reflexive meaning in the protolang. And it came from a noun that meant something like head probably. We might even be able to justify it just being ta in the protolang, but just to make things a little bit more interesting, let's give it this tiu form, where that pharyngeal causes vowel lowering and then they collapse together into one single low vowel. And with that, that's actually the bulk of the verb system done. I mean, that's the majority of tense, aspect, mood, and voice slash valency done. Don't get me wrong, we still have plenty left to do. So I guess the next logical thing to work on would be the causative, just to sort of keep going with valency stuff. But I have actually run into a little bit of a roadblock with the causative. So first of all, last time I did talk about potentially using the li form, uh, that means to give, as a lexical source for the causative. However, I did some rudimentary tests and just thought about it for a bit, and it occurred to me that if the causative is some sort of verbal element that you just stick at the end of the verb stem and before the converb ending, then that will have the effect of shifting the stress, and in so doing that's going to change a lot of the ways that the sound changes will manifest. So like here for example, if we take the root alhi, which is to sleep, and then we causativize that by putting ri to give as a suffix, then the difference in the forms we get is mainly just to do with vowel qualities. Ilhin versus ulhin, ulhir versus alhar, alhis versus ulhis. Now, for most affixes, I think this would be a good thing, because I've kind of engineered this whole system around forms not looking transparently related to each other, because that in general is something I strive for. However, with the causative, I think this is one instance where I might actually prefer having some transparency, some clear and obvious marker that you just stick on the verb and say, there you go, now it's causativized. It's because now, like this, any time you want to add the sense of to cause to do something to any verb, you essentially need to generate an entire extra set of principal parts. I would prefer it if it was just like you take whatever relevant principal part for the tense and aspect you're trying to get across and just add one simple affix or something. But honestly, I can't really think of any way to do it other than this. Because no matter how you play it, it's going to end up shifting the stress. Unless you just say that the causative evolved really, really recently. Either that, or if we say that the causative is actually a prefix, we would expect it to be a suffix, considering this is a prototypically head-final language. And so if to give is being used as an auxiliary, 
And if you're trying to say something like, I cause you to sleep, or I put you to sleep, which I hope is not the case, by the way, but if we were trying to say that, then that would have in the protolang been something like, I give sleep to you. And because give is the auxiliary that's conveying the majority of grammatical information, we expect that to come at the end in an SOV language. So it just sort of makes sense that it would become a suffix. However, maybe instead of saying that it was a typical auxiliary verb construction, we could maybe say that it was a serial verb construction. So instead it's just literally two verbs in a row. So something like, I give sleep you, like a verbal compound type thing. And in that case, I guess we could justify the causative coming first. I don't know. I think I might have to think about that one. Because, again, the main reason why I'm not totally on board is that it just makes the causative less usable. It's not nearly as, um, what's the word? It's not very easy to implement a sort of ad hoc. Like in a language like Nawak, you can just slap the causative on anything at any time, any time you need a sense of to cause to. You can just do that. Whereas in this language, it would need to have been derived historically. So it would be a little bit more like the English N prefix in that sense. Like in English, we can say uh, to enlarge, which is to make larger, or to enliven, to make more lively. But you can't say to unhappy. You can't just slap N on any verb or any adjective and just automatically get a causative meaning out of. It's only on a pretty closed class of words that you get that. So, I don't know. I mean, if we do have to go with this, it's not the end of the world. We would just have to come up with essentially another causative, a non-derivational causative, whenever you need to causativize a verb that didn't have a need to be causativized historically. I also worry that this, if we do, do go with this li, I think in a lot of verb forms that might just get swallowed up. It would be so easy for that vowel to just disappear, especially after the pharyngeal drops out, if it gets combined into a diphthong or something. So we might need something a little bit more robust. But if that's the case, then that puts a hole in this idea that we have of to remove being the causative of to lack, which I did really like that idea. I mean, I suppose we can edit these too, but since this one is being used for the prohibitive, I liked those. And I don't want to have to redo those unless it's absolutely necessary. I know I say this a lot, but I think I'm going to have to think about that one more off air. Now, according to my clock, I seem to be running short on time, which is a shame because it feels like I haven't actually done anything yet. But I'm going to press on for a bit. So something that's been on my mind recently is these evidential suffixes. I preemptively called them suffixes, they may not necessarily be suffixes. But the evidentials are one of the things that actually goes on the auxiliary verb, rather than the lexical verb. And I'm envisioning these things as being clitics. Basically, you can just take any of them and just stick them on the end of any of these. One, because it would just be a real pain to make a separate, distinct, evidential form for every single one of these, but also because that would just sort of make sense if these come from separate phrases that kind of got tacked on at some relatively late stage in the language. That would be very easy to justify. Now I had roughed in these ones, and I do actually think that's a pretty good set, because I don't want to go crazy with evidentials, I don't want to do one of these systems where there's like eight or nine different levels. I'm mainly looking for just one or two main ones, and the reportative and inferential seem like pretty likely candidates. So for the reportative, I can think of two potential sources. One is a phrase meaning I hear, which I think makes perfect sense. You can say something like I hear that such and such means that you heard the information from someone else. Or the other very common source for reportatives is verbs of speech, so something like they say. And for the inferential, you can have something like I sense, or I gather, or maybe it seems. That could work as well. And it also occurs to me, we have several options here. 
We could either do it like this and make them essentially full verb phrases. I hear that, I sense that. Or we could use converbs again. We could just say that this is a converb meaning hearingly or seemingly. I'm leaning towards having them be full phrases, just because we do use those converb suffixes a lot, especially since they are technically our case markers as well. So this should give us a little bit more variety in our endings. Assuming these are enclitics that come at the end of the auxiliary, that'll give us some distinctly different word endings from the case markers and the converbs or the forms for the principal parts. So I'm going to stick with that for now. Now, the mirrorative could be its own separate form. I, if I remember correctly, Korean has a separate mirrorative. I've definitely seen at least one language that has a distinct mirrorative, but it's also very common for just the regular evidentials to have built-in mirrorative meanings. So I think, for example, the inferential, if we just say that the inferential can be used to express a mirrorative, because it's like you're expressing surprise or disbelief, and by using the evidential you're saying, like, as astonishing as this is, I do have evidence for this. So applying the inferential to Bob ate the sandwich, that could either be interpreted as, it would seem that Bob ate the sandwich, like I have deduced this, or like, wow, apparently Bob ate the sandwich. What a remarkable turn of events. So that mirativity would just sort of be left up to context, so in that case it wouldn't get its own form. And then for the dubitative to express doubt, I'm going to essentially copy Turkish and just say, if you reduplicate the evidential, that encodes that you don't actually trust the source of information. So just using the reportative on its own would be like, I heard that Bob ate the sandwich, like other people have told me this. Whereas if you apply it twice, it's like, I heard that Bob ate the sandwich, but I have my doubts. We're just sort of emphasizing the fact that it, this is information that you've heard. It just draws attention to the fact that you've heard this information from somewhere else, so you, you did not in fact see it for yourself, and therefore it might be kind of doubtful. Which, on a somewhat related note, I'm surprised at how often I come across languages where, to encode some particular bit of information, you take one of the already existing affixes and just reduplicate it. Like, off the top of my head, in Mohawk, to convey the reciprocal, you just reduplicate the reflexive prefix. And I can't think of any other examples off the top of my head, but I have seen stuff like that happen multiple times. I'm kind of surprised how relatively common it is. Don't get me wrong, it's not super common. But like in Turkish, you do that too. You take the, the mish ending, the indirect past, and if you double it, you get mish mish, and that's the dubitative. Like, I can see how that sort of thing could happen, but it seems to be more common than I would have thought. Anyway, if these are going to be separate verb phrases, then we already know part of their phonological form. Looking up the pronouns in the proto-lang, we can tell I here is going to begin with nida, or some reduced version of that. Same with I sense. And for they say, we actually have some options. Because it could be they say, the human plural, or it could be one says, or it is said. Because we said pretty early on that this chatta form uh, becomes this indefinite, impersonal type thing, and ultimately the passive. Because in that case, I think that one would actually make the most sense. Whereas it seems, if you're inferring something from the available evidence... If you say, it seems that Bob ate the sandwich, what is it referring to? It is referring to the current situation as a whole. So is that indefinite, or is that just a regular inanimate? Indefinite would be like, something seems. Again, I think the indefinite might be the one to go for here. If it is being used as just a generic, impersonal type thing. Okay, so that's a half of the protoform. Now I am legitimately running out of time now. I don't think I'll have time to finish these. I'll work on them some more next time.
However, I do want to get just one noun done if I can. And as usual, for the sake of simplicity, it's probably going to have to be an inanimate. And looking at these categories, I think it's going to have to end in an R. Or an L, too, as long as it's a liquid. I think I'm going to go with grass as a meaning. Nice, basic, inanimate noun. What's a good word for grass? Let's just go with Nimir for the protoform and see what happens. Now, for this dative form here, we do have those two R's in two adjacent syllables. Now, if we were sticking with straight sound changes, we would expect the liquid dissimilation to kick in. However, because this is a case ending and it's being used all the time, again, we can get away with it being reduced more quickly. So I am strongly inclined to believe that those R's would blend together independent of any sound changes. But the nominative, and by extension the locative, remain the same as in the protoform, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty certain that that's just not affected by any of our sound changes. Okay, so be it. And now for the singular, which again, because grass is a mass noun, typically, the singular in this case will be like one blade of grass. Okay, but this last one, nimirurasya, the stress is on the U, which means that the vowel between the R and the S would be lost. And that palatal fricative would eventually turn into a plain S and then an R because it's in contact with the other R. Okay, in this instance, I'm not actually sure how the liquid dissimilation rule would work. Because we clearly have R's and adjacent syllables, but would that geminate turn into a geminate L? Maybe? I don't know, that seems a, a touch strange to me. I don't know, it just feels to me that a geminate would be more resistant to that kind of thing. If someone knows more about liquid dissimilation than me, like I know liquid dissimilation is a thing that happened in the Romance languages, so if someone else is able to explain to me in the comments how the Romance languages handled this sort of thing, then that would be a big help. But I'm going to stick with Nimirulla for now. Okay, and because we did that reasonably quickly, I think we can sneak in an example sentence as well. And in fact, now we have the opportunity to redo those applicative sentences that we did last time. So to start off, let's say, I hit the grass with the rock. In fact, just for a different tense, let's use the future. I will hit the grass with the rock. So future is form three combined with the second principal part. Form three of the first person singular is none. Then next is with the rock. And since we don't have any proper adpositions yet, I'm just going to use the dative for an instrumental. And then to hit in the second principal part, and we get nan irnuros nimirus rakar. And then if we wanted to applicativize that, promote the rock to the direct object, get rid of the grass, the rock is now in the accusative, and then the verb now takes the circumstantial slash instrumental voice, and in this case, that coda S would just meld into a geminate R. So we get, nan irnisse arkar. And then if we took that same sentence, got rid of the rock, and applied the detransitive prefix, nan tarakar, that would actually not be a complete phrase, because the detransitive requires you... Or well, actually, I guess, in its default form, it would be a reflexive, I guess? So maybe that would just mean I am hitting myself. But if we reintroduce the rock in the locative, nan irnis tarakar, that would have the antipassive interpretation. So it's I hit with something with general regards to the rock. Whereas if you put it in the dative, that would be a passive interpretation. That would be I will be hit by the rock. I believe that would be correct. Okay, cool. So... That is where I am going to have to call it. I still have lots of other stuff on the agenda to get to, so what I'm thinking about maybe doing is just recording a bunch of these in a row, and then, because I am mindful that I'm about to go into Alien Biosphere season, so to avoid just having several more months of just nothingness, I might get a bunch of these done and then release them every so often over the Alien Biospheres period. Maybe. I make no promises. But that's about it for now. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again next time.